Intiaz will now record. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you. So the last class, uh, we still continue with the individual. I told you when we started that we're talking about the individual, we're talking about groups and teams, and we're talking about the organization. Yeah. So those are the three main subdivisions in this particular course and organization theory. Not at all funny. Yeah, so um, we'll continue with the individual and I'm going to talk about two things today, emotions and moods and attitude. Yeah, why are emotions and moods um, so important and uh, why is attitude important and what has it got to do with a manager is something. After all, these are deeply psychological things. Psychologists talk about them, but why should you, as a manager, know at least the basic tenets of emotions? And then, so, for example, you are walking down to Kudlu Gate, the Island Sagar University, and you are on the road and you find a car barreling towards you at top speed. What do you feel? Or what do you do? You get off the road, okay? And what do you feel? Fear. So you can see that uh, event has caused you two things. It's caused you an emotion, that is fear, and there is an uh, there is an affect. Yeah, the affect is called as the affect is getting off the road. It leads to action. The interesting part as to why emotions are so important, we'll come to moods a little later. Sit down, sit down. Why emotions are so important is are that because of the fact that one, they lead to affect or action. Two is two, they sort of are deeply tied to what motivates us. Yeah. So the motivation center of the brain is deeply tied to why. So for example, uh, why do you jump off the road when you see a car barreling towards you? But why? But why? Sense of danger. Correct. But why? But why again? You saw the car. The car is barreling towards you. You feel fear. So what? It's basically emotion. Yeah. What else? Life is? So what is that? We got a Rajana Ryan in the class. You know who's Rajana Ryan? He was the joker during the Janata time in 1977. You said something, my friend. Go ahead. Okay, you have one life. Good. So, um, what is it that drives this action? Hmm? No, I'm still looking for that answer. What made you jump off the road? It's basically action from uh, woman side. You are motivated, Fear. motivated to want to live. There is, there is, you, all of us are any of you have a death wish? Death wish? No, right? So you're motivated to want to. So that is that is the connection between emotion, the affect, the action, and what area of motivation it drives, right? And that's why emotions are so important. So for example, um, sometimes, you know, if you're deeply connected with your job, you can have small emotional triggers affecting your performance in the office. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, emotions are very important because many of us don't understand it. We are also, um, we don't, we don't mull over why we feel these emotions and sort of it starts affecting our workplace behavior, which is fundamentally why you should be interested in 
what are emotions and again what are what is the difference between emotions and moods right why are they distinct what do you think is the difference between an emotion and a mood very good very good okay okay good what else is the difference between emotions and moods uh emotions can be seen moods cannot be seen you can see an emotion right yes okay okay it, uh... they need not be so how do you feel say on a sunday evening you feel happy so right so uh, what is classically called as monday blues so that is a general that's a general mood so there's a feeling of disquiet which is not as intense as an emotion so for example if you're if you're walking along the road and you see a dog being kicked that's a what do you feel you like a dog being kicked i mean there are people like that also so uh, it's fine but then you feel a deep sense of disgust maybe at somebody kicking a helpless dog that's a you have an intense feeling of disgust which rise which gives rise to maybe anger sadness and so on and so forth emotions are more subtle or, sorry moods are more subtle and they are pervasive and they extend for periods of time they are not short and sharp and um you can have you can you can say that i am in a bad mood for several several reason and both these can extend into your workplace and if you are a manager then impact sense and that's why you are sitting in this class today and talking about emotions and moods so some of the learning objectives that we're going to have are differentiate between emotions and moods identify the sources of emotions and moods what are the sources show the impact emotional labor has on what is emotional labor so for example one of the most difficult jobs is uh, being a flight steward flight steward if you're flown you know the person who serves you and so on and so forth why do you think it's a tough job absolutely you have to maintain a did you work any time okay so a lot of people um a lot of people have this problem and i you know um several years back when i was flying i think between bombay and bengaluru there was this girl who came and said she flights to her she said hello sir how are you and so on so what i was wondering who she is but then she said i was, i taught her in mba so i said this looks like a good job how long are you going to be here she said i'm leaving because it's very stressful why is it stressful because of the the fact of the matter is that you have to display emotions that you're really not you're really not sort of happy with or you really want to kick somebody on the back side but then you still have to say smile at them and so on and so forth that is a little bit about emotional labor yeah um and what does emotional labor do we'll talk a little bit let's go along describe the affects events theory the affective events theory that is emotional intelligence i think i alluded it alluded to it a little bit in my last class why is emotional intelligence so important um strategies for emotional regulation so how do you regulate your own your own emotions yeah so uh, should you regulate you regulate your emotions at all that's the question re new new dhachko re mummy a itte bidama ha adu itte bidradne alla ma nene mo mba class pettukunte class anamata Uh, yeah. Uh, so um describe okay identify strategies for emotional regulation because it's important because you just can't carry your wonderful emotions into into the workplace and then feel have issues apply concepts about emotions and moods to specific ob issues and what area of of course you're very early in the game
but what area um other ob areas you think affect emotions and moods ob i'm talking about organization behavior areas affect emotions and moods no no that's not an ob area what ob area affects emotions and moods or vice versa any one thing i told you motivation yes performance is not organization behavior is not ob is not ob is not ob ob i'm talking about organization behavior organization culture affects emotions and moods to a small extent yes okay fair enough hmm? is not ob evaluation of employees is not organized it's more hr employee engagement okay again uh, i think uh, offshoot of organization culture but emotions and moods are directly correlated with personality yeah so you can have people we'll talk about more about personality when we get there but you can have people who are neurotic or who are emotionally unstable yeah and um that emotional unstable instability sort of affects yeah yeah that uh, emotional um correlation between emotions and moods and personality really affects sort of how we display our emotions and moods so people who are neurotic or what we say are emotionally unstable show more propensity to display emotions say normal people that we see around do you think everybody is normal in terms of uh, emotional stability the answer is no and it's very difficult to pick up these signals during an interview process yeah so may i request everybody to mute themselves please mukesh i will have no alternative but to put you out of the class put one guy out of the class now i'll do it for more people sarvanan record somebody called zoom user okay so um that's what you have to sort of know by the end of the class so what are emotions emotions are interpretations of feelings they are interpretations of feelings while in everyday speech emotion and feeling are often used interchangeably psychologists distinguish between them we'll stay with the psychologists and try to distinguish between emotions and feelings the feelings you have are what psychologists call affect and you will see you will hear about affect emerge from your motivational system you generally feel good when you are succeeding at your goals and bad when you are not so um it's again the feeling part of it the more deeply your motivation system is engaged with the situation the stronger are your feelings so for example um if you are really engaged with your work and you have negative things are not going well you display greater emotions in terms of the work not going well and so on and so forth so for example if you are deeply in love with somebody and there is a breakup then you will again have an issue with terms of how um, you display those emotions so um very interesting area how emotions sort of start impacting your daily going on now i am at 100% i knew that i'd never be able to take on Can you folks come on time, please? So, um, if you look at if you look at um, the affect, or we said, what is affect? I just now told you. If you are paying attention, rather than looking at the door, what is affect? No, no, no. Please, can you read off the board? Can you read off the board? 
can you read off the board the feelings you have what psychologists called affect so this is the affect theory defined as a broad range of feelings that people experience affect can be experienced in the form of emotions or yeah and uh, what are emotions closed caused by specific events very brief in duration seconds or minutes you can feel anger you can feel um, disgust we'll see what are those universal emotions that we have um specific and numerous in nature and usually accompanied by distinct facial expressions so it's very difficult to sort of not show facial expressions when you have so when you are angry people can see that you are angry or when you are sad people can see that you are sad and so on and so forth it's action oriented in nature generally people there is an outcome there is an action attached with there is an action and there is a dependent on the motivation there is an action associated with emotions right so if you see like i said if you see a dog getting kicked on the road you might like to do something about it yeah so moods are causes often general and unclear you can just get up with a bad mood you're not sure what why why it has really been caused um last longer than emotions so you can have it for hours or days more general so again um positive effect and negative effect again we'll see what that is they composed of multiple specific emotions generally not indicated by distinct expressions and they are cognitive in nature what is cognition cognition is thinking your thought process so um, again uh, what your experiences in childhood have been um and so on and so forth so what gets you folk into a bad mood not an emotion a mood why do you sometimes get slip into a bad mood maybe you have had a disagreement with somebody a couple of days back and then it extends yeah uh, what else given assigned task not done on time okay okay what else the right class right place you feel short changed and then there's a feeling of disquiet okay okay what else why else do you think huh you hear some bad news and you have a health condition very good okay what else negative thoughts anything anything so so for example does the weather get you into a bad mood yeah i remember that you know um if you go to countries like sweden and so on and so forth you don't see sunlight for months together maybe 6 months in a year and can that cause bad mood at least for me it does yeah if you don't see sunlight for extended periods of time or you are sort of um, many people sort of had these mood issues during covid why because they could not leave their so i really can't understand why people want to work from home i mean i can't understand it's my point of view really yeah i like to get out of my home go for my morning walk maybe hit the gym once in a week turn up here it's good to talk to fellow faculty and students and so on and so forth because it's a mood uplifter yeah so um emotions and moods and you must know the distinction so some universal emotions so this is accepted all over the world and what are these anger is all of us feel everybody across the world feels anger they feel they they feel fear they feel sadness they feel happiness they feel disgust and they feel surprise so these are um, you know six essential universal universal emotions that is anger fear sadness happiness disgust surprise and everything else is a variation of some of these or a combination of um these and so on and so forth anybody disagrees with this list you want to add something here okay so as you know 
you can also have moral emotions moral emotions emotions that have emotions that have moral implications because of our instant judgment of the situation what are moral emotions moral emotions I think all over the world, uh, people will feel bad if you kick a dog. I'm talking about an emotion that is specific to say Indians. No, no. Give me a specific instance where. No, don't talk about them. Talk about you. What is it? What is it that you can associate? You express an emotion because. You are, it disturbs you. So, for example, um, how many of you really feel bad if you're caught copying? Copying, copying, cheating, and thrown out of an examination. Not too much. I don't think so. Indians, somehow we are not, there is not too much of a moral connection between being caught. You might feel ashamed, but there is not real moral. You don't think you have done anything wrong right so uh, that's a problem but in the west in the west this could be a serious moral issue they they really feel um so in the west you can actually really feel um, morally distraught if you are caught copying. So you have, say, universities like Harvard and so on and so forth. You can actually feel morally distraught if you are caught copying. So, uh, organization, so universities like, say, Harvard or um, Stanford do not have an invigilator. During your exams, just let me take off the invigilator. Yeah. Despite several warnings, can you come on time, please, next time? Yeah, please help me. So um, it causes a lot of um, what is I talking about? Yeah, moral moral emotions. So what else? What else is morally problematic? So for example, let me give you another example specifically. Suppose you're traveling around the, down the nice road and you have you have your, 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 the speed limit is 80 miles an hour or 80 kilometers an hour and your best friend is doing 85 and you get stopped and you're called to court to justify and to bear witness. Would you say that your, and your friend says, no, I was driving at 75. Would you support your friend or say, tell the truth? Most of your friends, most of Indians will support the moral emotion. Yeah, this won't happen in the West. Very clear distinction between what is morally correct. I, I'm not talking about good or bad. I'm just talking about culturally how we are constructed. So you actually, you need to be careful because different cultural subsets display different emotions. And it could become a problem because you misunderstand and so on and so forth, right? So um, yeah, I can go on about it, but, but I think you get the drift. So moral emotions are display are developed during childhood because we are deeply steeped in our culture. We learn from our parents, grandparents, um, subsystems, cohorts that we live in and so on and so forth. Because more, and, but you must understand moral emotions can again, I stress upon this can differ from one cultural subset to another cultural subset. So I had a South African friend who used to say that, you know, um, uh, he used to see Ro, uh, he was working here. Uh, he set up that Mantri mall and so on and so forth. Um, so he used to say that, you know, Nagaraj, when I see cows uh, roaming on the road, I feel like catching one and eating it. So I would tell him, be a little careful. Yeah, because uh, this is a moral question. Yeah, and you actually might get skinned yourself. So, so, so um, um, these are very tricky areas. 
for you to navigate as so particularly if you go to a foreign country and so on and yeah so because morality is a construct that differs between cultures so do moral dimensions uh, this is you know the structure of mood and you have something you you have the effect or the feeling part of it so you have a high positive effect to a low negative effect you can look at this continuum here and it starts with being excited elated happy content serene and relaxed this is the low negative effect and you have a high negative effect that is tense nervous stressed upset sad depressed bored and then the low negative effect is fatigue so all these are out out outputs of your mood and how you sort of feel so some people can feel really tense i have to make a presentation to my boss is on tuesday so i feel tense right um or i could feel very so if i feel tense it's a high negative effect if i feel excited and alert it's a so if you ask people like sachin tendulkar or or uh, uh, virat kohli they feel a certain amount of tension when they go on to irrespective of the number of runs they have scored but that makes them more alert yeah so if your tension makes you feel nervous stressed and upset then you have a little bit of a problem rather than being alert excited when you have certain so how do you make that sort of transition when you sort of from your the mood you feel to your affect or feeling is very important and so think about it when you have when you're in a bad mood why did you get into that bad mood first of all right and what is the effect of that bad mood or the feeling that has come out do you shout at your subordinates are you very grumpy are you sort of short with your boss you probably can't see his or her uh, point of view and so on and so forth so that mindfulness is extremely important in terms of um, emotions and moods so the idea of this whole you know discussion is can you sort of think about your own state of mind your emotions and moods and then reflect upon it as to how you can improve upon it so that you don't affect your work your subordinates and the people who are associated with you even at home maybe yeah suppose you you had a bad day in the office you come home and sort of take it out on your wife or husband for that matter yeah or children for that matter so it happens quite often because people are not mindful about how their emotions and moods impact their actions and feelings so more importantly um more importantly um Uh, many of us um you know make decisions by either thinking or feeling thinking is like i think i mentioned in the last class thinking is you sort of um think through a problem very very um carefully yeah and then you examine a lot of evidence you examine a lot of data and then you come out with a possible solution but that is very difficult that is very difficult because the human brain is not really equipped to tax itself the human brain wants to come with very quick solutions so many times we overlook evidence we overlook data and then we come to decisions by feeling that is we are relying on say evolutionary mechanisms that are hardwired in our system right so for example if you are taking a walk down the hosur road and you see a tiger what will you do are you going to go and pet it on the head what are you going to do going to run why who told you did anybody tell you to run it's evolutionary yeah but if you go to a zoo and you see a tiger behind bars do you run why because you're thinking right so people are expected to think but you don't think unfortunately most people because it's troublesome you feel stressed out you have to tax that piece of machinery which has gone to rust you have not used it for several several years yeah and you just rely on the feeling part in making decisions 
and unfortunately emotions can strongly affect how you feel and make decisions and even how you think and make decisions and as a manager that is very critical that's why they say that so i know i have very interesting story of when i was doing my masters and um did i tell you the story sometimes i told you of 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 you know um these are um, very difficult uh, viva voce where you have to do sort of for you say the project viva is about half an hour for me it's about a it went on for about a month and you have to turn up in bombay in a suit and sit in that summer heat um it's very difficult so i when i it's difficult to pass its endurance and do you have the stamina to sort of go through that entire process and then the examiner finally said nagraj you have passed so that means now i am cleared to become captain to so very elated because as a cadet for a career you dream of that moment where you sort of attain that rank so i came out and i was really happy and jumping with joy and i met a family on that ballot pier and they had two kids father mother and that man said you know i have lost all my money i have to go to nashik so i said what do you want he said can you give me 500 rupees so i put my hand into my pocket 500 rupees in 1996 was a lot of 1995 i think was a lot of money so i gave him the question is would i have given him this money if i had failed that is where emotions sort of start affecting your decision making process so that is why the common adage is never make decisions when you are very happy or you are very sad because it can affect your decision making process yeah so that 500 rupees never came back of course but that is a different story altogether um do emotions make us ethical research on moral emotions question the previous belief that emotional decisions making is based on higher level cognitive processes our beliefs are shaped by our groups resulting in unconscious responses and a shared oral emotion this may allow us to justify purely emotional reactions as rationally ethical just because we share them with others so for example if all indians believe in an emotion it not necessarily is right yeah or or if all uh, say our friends the pakistanis believe in an emotion it not necessarily is right or wrong yeah it's just that they are culturally like that we are culture you have to keep this in mind particularly when you meet people of another country because they can come with so i know the bueller folk deal a lot with switzerland yeah so the swiss have different kinds of um, they display different kinds of they very germanic that is they are very schedule oriented they very time oriented um their sense of humor is not great and so on and so they would like to get to business very quickly rather than like us so we start a conversation with where do you live how many children do you have where did your son or daughter go to school that's all the building of trust but some of those societies let like to get to business and i i do this many times when i meet people from that part of the world and they want something from me then i keep them like this i keep them for 20 minutes talking about their family and so on and so forth and i can see the annoyance level rising but since they want something from me they uh, they have to tolerate yeah so that's how it is so you have to be intelligent about emotions so um, sources of emotions and moods are personality of course i said there is a direct correlation between personality and um emotions and moods uh, they have a trait component so trait are first what are personality trait what is personality exactly before we get to it maybe in the next class what is what is your understanding of personality i told you one of them you can be emotionally unstable or neurotic neurosis there are a lot of people who are emotionally unstable you agree with me or no yeah and and i think as i go through life i see more and more people are emotionally unstable and actually they need help yeah um so what are the other traits one is of course neuroticism what is what are the other traits of emotion what do you think 
so you have several things like you know being an introvert being an extrovert yeah um you can you can sort of um, is an is an emo, is a personality trait you can have so some of you might be introverts some of you might be extroverted you can be something called as conscientious it's not conscious all of us are conscious but being conscientious that is how responsible you are um towards other people and towards so you know there was an interesting book i was reading and this is a research done in america and um, the author jordan peterson says that about 50% people don't read the prescription that is given by the and of the other 50% who read the prescription only about 20% sort of get uh, the medicines and take them what does this indicate why does this happen i mean 100% go to the doctor 50% don't read the prescription out of the other 50% 20% only buy the medicines and take what is happening to the other 80% yes self yes, self not not really what else what do you think what do you think might be happening here you don't trust the doctor why do you go to him in the first place so jordan peterson says that there are several people who hate themselves it's a very very interesting observation and he says that species who hate themselves really don't take care of themselves and this is a manifestation of several people who really don't care so they don't care about themselves and they don't care about anything else or other people and people who deeply care about themselves actually take care of themselves first while before taking care of other we were taught that when we jump when we were on a sinking ship they said first take care of yourself so that if you are safe you can then take care of other people rather than getting pulled down with by somebody else. so personality is an is an intriguing topic and we will talk a lot about it uh, how do you how do you find out what personality traits are there in people and so on and so forth what are some psychometric tests and then uh, who do you think in india runs the most psychometric tests you know psychometric tests where they're checking your personality who in india do your companies accenture cognizant do they do psychometric tests i think most companies don't do it yeah but nevertheless which is the big player in india who uses psychometric tests so the indian army yeah they will put you through a full day of psychometric test because for them personality is critical and if they don't care how agile or how much of strength physical strength you have if you don't make the personality make up to serve in those that particular institution it's not about you being intelligent or not it's just that you may have the personality or you may not have the personality to serve in that particular that's why many times you know when people go for a, a service selection board there are 30 people in a cohort by and large 30 sometimes you will have all 30 being sent home with no the average selection is about 3 10% but otherwise you might for an officer but otherwise you might feel you might have situations where nobody is everybody sort of goes why mostly because their personality there are personality issues not with people but as far as the indian army is concerned that you don't fit the personality requirement of the armed forces yeah so then the times of day there's a common pattern for all of us happier in the midpoint of the daily awake period so maybe if you wake up at 6 o'clock and sleep at say 10 o'clock you are happiest at about 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon again research these are not my findings uh, if you want to sort of counter this you will have to do your own research and come up with a finding days of the week happier towards the end of the week we all know why people are happier towards the end of the week because you have your holidays coming up and so on and so forth and you have this classic thing called monday blues that uh, that's why in the us they used to say never buy a car that is built on a monday if you have that influence never buy a car built on a monday or a friday yeah, both are because monday people have that hangover they're in a bad mood and um, you know so on and so forth friday they are all ready to go home and do whatever they do on the weekend 
very interesting how really emotions can get tied to small mundane facts yeah so the weather that is um illusory correlation um but i believe that the weather really influences how our moods and emotions play out at least i feel it when i don't like this kind of weather which is cloud i like the sun on my back i like the sun to be shining in a better frame of mind even low levels of constant stress can worsen some people are under constant why does stress why so are you guys stressed in your job anytime why does it come why does it come? workload okay what else so my understanding my understanding is that people are stressed at work when really they don't know their job very well and it becomes worse when the boss also doesn't know the job very well so you actually feel helpless and you don't know where to you don't know what to do now yeah because you don't want to ask your subordinates because ego kicks in you don't know the job your boss also doesn't know the job and your boss's boss doesn't want to talk to you so so these are these are interesting problems and i think a lot of stress so if you are pretty good at your um so when i actually uh, gave up my i was in netherlands and i came back um i got a job interview with um ibm and i said other than microsoft word and excel i have no idea at all they said no problem you have got leadership qualities you can you will have all iitns reporting to you all you have to do is to be their leader i don't know how it works really you know because i really had no clue what the job was and i'm pretty happy that i did not take that job and make that decision to join an organization where i had no clue about the work that was being done yeah so anyway social activities there is a lot of correlation between physical informal uh, activities dining activities which increase positive mood so you can go and have say dinner with a set of friends or people you like that can also add to stress suppose your friend tells you i bought a mercedes benz last week so again uh, you went so that's why they say that uh, there's a lot of tension when you go to you know renew alum renewal uh, function say 30 years hence you pass out of school and you turn up over there and you now if you've done really well in life it's okay but if you have not then it gives rise rise to a lot of um, stress because you see people who are very ordinary like you maybe maybe they have done well in life and so forth yeah sleep so poor sleep quality increases negative um effect yeah okay and exercise does somewhat improve so if you're not going for a walk please start go and get some physical exercise leave your home go for a jog take your dog out for a walk whatever you do but go and get some exercise uh, particularly for depressed that's why in a lot of countries if you suffered a nervous breakdown they suggest that you go and live in the country or outskirts and then take long walks because it seems to sort of calm your nerves and improves things age older people tend to focus more on positive stimuli than younger so much of the emotional turmoil occurs amongst young people yeah as you age i think you learn to manage them much better and uh, uh, so uh, older pe older people seem to manage emotions much better and of course gender uh, both men and women um express the same amount of emotions but women seem to express them more really and you don't have a uh, men say uh, bursting into tears and so on and so forth invariably if i carry out an enquiry and there's a woman involved she will cry yeah uh, i i am sure that if a man is involved he also is feeling just as bad but he doesn't so the expression of emotion is a little restricted is more prevalent amongst um women yeah so that's a little bit about emotions and moods uh, emotional labor we were talking about an employee's expression of organizational desired emotions so um if you go to walmart i don't know how many of you have been to walmart uh, the american store have you anybody yeah so 
uh, in america if you go the walmart when they assemble in the morning do a walmart jingle that is all of them hold hands and do a dance and when walmart opened their store in um, who opened the stores in germany they said that you should do the walmart jingle and the german said that we will quit the reason being that they felt that showing this unnecessary emotion or showing an emotion of bonding and happiness when it was not there not was giving rise to a lot of stress so emotional labor is when you feel an emotion like i said the flight steward um example when you feel emotion but you are expressed you are expected to display and that's why some jobs like <clears throat> a teacher's job um i might really be unhappy and not willing to take this class but i need to turn up and look engaged and involved and happy yeah do you have to do that not required you can actually switch off and sit there and it's no skin off anybody's nose but for teacher it's a problem similarly for doctors so these are kind of pretty um you know uh, the emotional labor levels are very very high particularly when you are interacting social uh, the flight stewards when you are interacting with a lot of people yeah or the hotel receptionists and so on and so forth. so how do you deal with emotional labor suppose you have you take a job because the money is good for example for, for example vinay do you smoke this is professor vinay yeah a young professor and uh, he sort of maybe will pitch in sometime but do you smoke used to you stop anybody smokes none of you smoke none of the ladies smoke it's fantastic okay um how many of you hate smoking that's good that's a good number yeah you hate smoking now um suppose you are take yourself back say 10 years you're just you're graduating you wow well, you're looking for a job it's important the money is important and itc comes along and offers you a lakh a month while well, the next best job is giving you 30000 rupees a month but you know itc manufactures and you just now told me you hate smoking will you join so therein lies the problem so now you have strong value systems or you have strong emotions but you are sort of suppressing those emotions and you are taking up a job or work that is an antithesis of those value systems or so what do you do now how do you manage this one is of course you can say uh, these are my principles i will not join i will forego that money and then you can sort of take care of it but you have joined what do you do hmm? you have to adjust what else can you do uh, so that is what causes stress when you say i will adjust hmm? you can act you can sort of act as if you have no problem and you can that's a little better what else can you do you can actually start smoking and you can say that you can say that i really love smoking now i think it's good for health it's good for my teeth or whatever and i'm going to do this and 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 a lot of people um, you know get by that way so you get into a job you really don't like it because it is colliding with your value systems which is causing negative emotions one way of dealing with it if you don't have too much of a choice is to start liking what you are doing yeah and make that mental shift so it's what is called as deep acting and not surface level acting where you just pretending to like the job but you are not actually you don't actually like it yeah so um required required or appropriate emotion so if you are in germany and you are supposed to do the walmart jingle you can say i love to do this dance in the morning and i am going to i am going to go and um do it yeah and then you can like it what's that right so emotional dissonances inconsistencies between the emotions people feel and the emotions they so again uh, uh, an extension of emotional labor long term emotional dissonance is a predictor of job 
that's why it's so important yeah so you are really you are really interested in money but you became a professor yeah where the where the pays are not not on industry there are other perks but definitely the money part of it is a little bit of a problem do you think it leads to burnout it does because if you're constantly battling this requirement for money and then you're working in a profession for some other reason that really doesn't appeal to you it could lead to job burnout declines in job performance and lower job why are we concerned with job satisfaction okay. so tell me something my friend what's your name rohit suppose you had your last 5 rupees left you have nothing else and you have to bet on a race the race is between a very satisfied donkey and a very disgruntled horse where would you put your 5 rupees on a satisfied donkey so don't get this efficiency satisfaction thingy there are a lot of satisfied people who don't produce any value yeah there are a lot of people who are disgruntled who actually produce a lot of value so there can be people who are not happy but are giving out immense value and there can be a lot of jokers who are very satisfied but who are just coasting in an organization and who are giving no value at all but there is something else that happens if you are not satisfied and job satisfaction is an attitude so what could happen why are companies concerned about job satisfaction why should you be concerned if you're a manager suppose somebody comes and tells you i'm not satisfied with my job people carry out i think your organizations might be carrying out a gallup poll right where they come and take check out how satisfied you are or not why okay okay yeah. no but why are they concerned about job satisfaction it's very important sir uh, to have a satisfied yeah true that's why so it will improve our productivity if you are no, not no not really not really not really yeah, yeah there is there, i agree with you there's a linear correlation but that's not the most important reason employee absolutely so attrition is really tied to job so you know many years back i had gone to the somebody told me that they work with hcg or something the hcg which is a kind of a bpo and the guy there the the managing director said that our attrition is 300% what does it mean actually when somebody tells you their attrition rate is 300% what what does it mean no 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 what does it mean in real number no no i have to give you you'll have to give a more simplistic answer than that absolutely as that's a big picture but what does it mean in mathematical terms 300% attrition means that every 4 months the entire crew is leaving and they're getting a new set of this is humongously costly because you have to retrain several hundreds of uh, people and it's a little bit of a um, problem yeah so um, you are talking about job satisfaction because there's a direct correlation of course between productivity how happy people are. you are happy people around you but it also impacts the attrition rates and i think most companies are quite happy with about 10 12% uh, of um attrition yeah if you have less than that you might be actually hanging on to people who are useless and who are not adding any value to you but who are hanging on because it's to pay them and they come and sit there every day yeah so okay um we'll just talk about this Uh, affective events theory we've talked about it earlier but employees react emotionally to things that happen to them at work and this influences job performance and satisfaction we all know that emotions provide valuable insights into how workplace events influence employee performance and so what are things at work that can actually cause problems to you in terms of emotions i'm talking about the work not the family what is it that can happen at work so somebody said lack of a promotion yeah you're expected to get promoted but you sort of it doesn't happen what else you are not performing as well as you think you should okay okay 
ओके नॉट वेल एक्यूब टू डू द जॉब ओके वॉट एल्स दे नॉट यूजिंग ऑल योर स्किल सेट्स ओके विच यू हैव अ प्रॉब्लम यू आर अपडेटेड बट दे आर नॉट यूजिंग दोज ओके वॉट एल्स not getting enough of support very good absolutely not getting enough of um support and um you expect some support but you are not getting it from either your colleagues your bosses or you are made to feel uh, unincluded you know, you know people go for coffee or tea with leaving you out or they uh, gather in small clusters and as soon as you go they all stop talking so all these can actually have an impact on your emotional um feelings employees and managers shouldn't include ignore emotions or the events that cause them even when they appear minor because they accumulate so people come and tell you that they're feeling emotionally distraught and so on and so forth if you're an organization that cares then you should sort of um be concerned about it that's why in say uh, the richer western countries almost everybody has got a therapist yeah how many of you have a therapist even if you even huh who generally giving you wrong advice ha huh. so therapists are generally trained people psychologically trained people who can sort of discern what you are you might be going through and um um it's when you go for counseling with untrained people like friends and so on and so forth i'm not sure what kind of Uh, advise you are actually, or how that is deconstructed. The opodo mundo action. Yeah. So um, that's the affective events theory, and we briefly talked about this emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is a person's ability to perceive emotion in the self, and it's not about only you. It's also about other people in self and others. understand the meaning of these that's very important understand why you have these emotions or why other people are having these um emotions yeah and regulate one's emotions accordingly in a cascading uh, model that is um you calibrate your emotional expression of emotion suppose you are angry with somebody at the workplace do you go and hit him on the face It's calibration of why can't you hit him on the face you be thrown out yeah so that is uh, you that's an economic issue why else can you go and hit somebody on the face? so suppose you are driving and then uh, there is a guy who brushes past you in the car do you feel angry why don't you go and hit him two things one he can hit back secondly um it doesn't make you look good in society yeah because you are expected to be a civilized law abiding person and you can't go and sort of keep hammering random people on the but don't expect other people are not there who will do that they don't have the same constructs yeah for them it might be perfectly normal to come and hammer hit you on the nose yeah so you always have to be a little so that's the problem because when you come with a set of beliefs value systems and constructs you believe you expect other people to also have them doesn't have, that's why you have certain amount of confusion in the city so in the city is just like the united states where you get several people from several parts of world or india coming and living how do the americans manage it why is why is law and order so tight in america that is very much my why why do you see do you see the chaos that we have here suppose you go to new york which is a bigger city do you see the chaos that they have we have why freedom why why don't you see that kind of chaos are they smarter people better people why suppose somebody has come from ukraine um and somebody from russia do they behave well in new york they do why 
because the americans have nailed something well they as soon as you turn up they will throw the rule book at you and if you don't follow the rule book the damages are you can be deported you can be jailed you can be fined which doesn't happen in india so people are pretty feel feel free so you can actually can come from say uh um, like like uh, my friend here can come from jammu and kashmir and bring your own set of practices and then operate with immunity yeah uh, because we do not have the ability to enforce laws for whatever reason whatever reason. maybe we are a very benign society we like to absorb all sorts of things so we say okay you carry on with your way of life i will do my so you have people coming on the wrong side of the road suddenly out of nowhere um why because in his part of the world going on the wrong side of the road was pretty normal so uh, my wife you know has had a few close shaves and she says but he was wrong i keep telling it doesn't work like that the person in the car is wrong always yeah so you have to be a little but in america wrong is wrong you die in an accident that you are walking jay walking on the road and you get run over hard luck mate you should not have been on the road and the guy will just run you over and the case is closed so um why are we talking about this stuff yeah okay so um finally regulate one's emotions accordingly you know yeah we're talking about if you have if you meet a accident on the road and so on so forth um and again aggression on the road is very very minimal in america why because the law here it's an expression of helplessness i think people get aggressive on the road in india because they know nothing much is going to happen so there is anger and there is rage america nothing like that everybody just walks away because insurance takes care of care of okay so uh, um what is the cascading model of emotional intelligence and um so are you sort of conscientiousness i told you is a personality trait some of us are conscientious yeah um i have seen you know i have been to several 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 student selections i have gone all over the country in selecting students and say i go to delhi and i have to select say 200 people have lined up to join the mba program invariably i find that those people who have come about half an hour early and are sitting there are the ones who are much better the fellows who come in late yeah after the process has started um badly dressed and so on and so forth do badly in the interview there seems to be some direct correlation which i think is what is called as conscientiousness are you really responsible towards yourself and what you are approaching so if you are conscientious then you perceive emotions in self and otherwise you can say i care less i'm really not concerned what other people feel cognitive ability that is cognitive ability is what do you have anything there in the upper story or not and please believe me there are several people who have nothing there yeah so um it's politically incorrect to say that but in my experience there are many people who actually have very poor ability to think through something so cognitive ability if is there understand the meaning of emotions and then emotional if you're emotionally stable then you regulate those emotions otherwise you go to sort of pieces yeah so that's a very interesting model for emotional intelligence again uh, it's critical for managers to be emotionally intelligent because you need to understand your emotions and you need to understand the emotions of your um colleagues manager so if for, for example if you have a boss who is emotionally unstable what do you do you learn how to manage boss difficult yeah you can quit the job or, or you can get the boss to quit the job uh which might actually be better option yeah so these are tough problems that you find in so have you people worked and we have spoken long enough have you worked with emotionally unstable people anytime you can have them in your family as well yeah 
were emotionally distraught. How do you deal with those people? Let them talk. Okay. Okay. What else? It's a tough problem. Yeah. So, um, but then um, since I'm not a therapist, I will, I can figure out personality through tests, but I'm not a therapist to give you psychological counseling as to what to do. Suppose you're feeling suicidal. You want to jump off the 10th floor. How do you deal with this? Yeah. So suppose somebody comes and tells you that I want to jump off the 10th floor. What do you do? They jump. Let's see you jump. Do you do that? Or are you more empathetic? Do you sort of try to counsel the person? Do you send them to a regular counselor? What do you do? So these are, these are things that you need to actually think about a little bit, particularly if you are in large teams and you're dealing with several people because there are many, many, many issues out there. Yeah. So some of the strategies are emotional regulation involves identifying and modifying the emotions you feel. Diversity in work groups may help us to regulate our emotions more consciously and we talked about diversity in the last class. Why is this? Why is diversity in work groups may help us to regulate our emotions more consciously and effectively? You, you realize the different people. What else? What else? So, you know, um, my, the first time I was commanding a ship, we were going to, um, I was 29 years old. Most of the people on board were older than me. And they were sort of a lot of drunkards on board. People who would drink and cause problems. So I called everybody on deck. And we were supposed to go for a ship repairs project, long one in Colombo, in Sri Lanka. So I told them that, look, um, and they looked at me expectantly. Some of them were amused because young captain, experienced crew. So I told them, look, we're going to Colombo, which is a foreign country. I hope all of you understand that. And it's not part of India. So all about it. And I said that um, Samira NS. You are in the entry level. Your resume should be so, uh, so I told them that we're going to foreign country and all of you are ambassadors for this, for India. So please conduct yourself as ambassadors for, and that seemed to have struck a chord with many of my crew. All of them were actually perfectly well behaved and sort of they, so the, so the point is that I think you feel more under scrutiny when you go to a foreign country, foreign set of people that you actually behave that I think People who are actually, um, you know, urinating on the roadside, would they do it in Singapore? No, of course they'll put you in jail. But I, but, but I don't see this happening also in, say, Sri Lanka or when they go to Sweden or they go to some of those countries. Yeah, you might actually die of cold if you do it in Sweden. But um, generally, people are better behaved because of the fact that you feel you are under some kind of. Here, this is our own land and we can we own this place right i vote i have elected modi ji so i have a right to do what i feel that i should be doing which is a little bit of a and i think it also occurs in the workplace if you have diverse people who have come from different areas your general social interaction or behavior is is that how it is or you feel different So obviously, when you are dealing with, say, Swiss folk, you behave better. Yeah, you behave. You, yeah, you respect time. You sort of are slightly better behaved. You don't talk um, nonsense, and uh, which you might actually do in a purely Indian uh, setup. And so, on. so unless you consciously want to do it. Okay, so we will uh, take a break. We'll come back at uh, 11. What's the time now? We'll come back at 11 o'clock. Guys online, we'll return at 11. Sure, sir. Thank you.
Another interesting uh, movie clip, um, and I wanted to sort of look at it. Maybe we'll play two, this one and another one. Tell me what you understand. Um, fundamentally, the, this is representing the American military, and there's a this is a courtroom scene, and uh, where a senior officer is supposed to have given an order, but he sort of. He says he did not, and because of which two junior, um, you know, uh, people from the ranks are accused of manslaughter. Or, or what is you know what's manslaughter? So it's not first degree murder, but it is. Uh, nevertheless, you are responsible for the death of somebody. It carries a jail term. So, for example, if you run over somebody on the road, it is manslaughter. It may not tantamount to murder. It will tantamount to manslaughter, yeah, which is slightly less of a crime then. Um, so this is the uh, clip, the movie clip about, and you can sort of then we can discuss it briefly as to what is really going on. And guys online, I would like you to mute, please, unless you have something to say. Sridhar Inamdar. Yeah, thank you. And let's watch this. Maybe our friend Mukhtar uh, can help us here. Yeah. There's some silence. Lieutenant Cathy. We are unable to hear, sir. Have nothing you nothing have anything spoken for this witness. Thanks, Danny. I love Washington. Excuse me. I didn't dismiss you. I beg your pardon. I'm not through with my examination. Sit down. Colonel. What's that? I'd appreciate if he would dress me as Colonel or Sir. I believe I've earned it. Defense counsel will address the witness as Colonel or Sir. I don't know what the hell kind of unit you're running here. And the witness will address this court as judge or your honor. I'm quite certain I've earned it. Take your seat, Colonel.
What do you want to discuss now? My favorite color? Colonel, the 6 a.m. flight was the first one off the base? Yes. There wasn't a flight that left seven hours earlier and landed at Andrews Air Force Base at 2 a.m.? Lieutenant, I think we've covered this, haven't we? Your Honor, these are the Tower Chief's logs for both Guantanamo Bay and Andrews Air Force Base. Guantanamo log lists no Escaped. flight that left at 11 p.m. and the Andrews log lists no flight that landed at 2 a.m. I'd like to admit them as defense exhibits Alpha and Bravo. I don't understand. You're admitting evidence of a flight that never existed. Well, we believe it did, sir. Defense will be calling Airman Cecil O'Malley and Airman Anthony Rodriguez. They were working the ground crew at Andrews at 2 a.m. on the 7th. Your Honor, these men weren't on the list. Rebuttal witnesses, Your Honor, are called specifically to refute testimony offered under direct examination. I'll allow the witnesses. This is ridiculous. Colonel, a moment ago, check the tower logs, for Christ's sake. Well, we'll get to the airman in just a minute, sir. A moment ago, you said that you ordered Lieutenant Kendrick to tell his men that Santiago wasn't to be touched. That's right. And Lieutenant Kendrick was clear on what you wanted? Crystal. Any chance Lieutenant Kendrick ignored the order? Ignored the order? Any chance he forgot about it? No. Any chance Lieutenant Kendrick left your office and said, the old man is wrong? No. When Lieutenant Kendrick spoke to the platoon and ordered them not to touch Santiago, any chance they ignored him? You ever served in an infantry unit, son? No, sir. Ever served in a forward area? No, sir. Ever put your life in another man's hands? Asked him to put his life in yours? No, sir. We follow orders, son. We follow orders or people die. It's that simple. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Are we clear? Crystal. Colonel, I have just one more question before I call Airman O'Malley and Airman Rodriguez. If you gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, and your orders are always followed, then why would Santiago be in danger? Why would it be necessary to transfer him off the base? Santiago was a substandard Marine. He was being transferred... That's not what you said. You said he was being transferred because he was in grave danger. That's correct. You said he was in danger. I said, grave danger? You said, is there I any recall other... what I, I said. I can have the court reporter read back to you. I know what I said. I don't have to have it read back to me like I'm... Why the two orders? orders? Colonel? Sometimes men take matters into their own hands. No, sir. You made it clear just a moment ago that your men never take matters in their own hands. Your men follow orders or people die. So Santiago shouldn't have been in any danger at all, should he have, Colonel? You snotty little bastard. Your Honor, I'd like to ask for a recess. I'd like an answer to the question, Judge. The court will wait for an answer. If Lieutenant Kendrick gave an order that Santiago wasn't to be touched, then why did he have to be transferred? Colonel? Lieutenant Kendrick ordered the code red, didn't he? Because that's what you told Lieutenant Kendrick to do. Object! And when it went bad, you cut crazy. these guys loose! Your Honor, you had Marcus inside a phony transfer. Your Honor, you doctored the logbook. Damn it, Captain! You coerced the doctor. Consider Not yourself in contempt. Colonel Jessup, did you order the code red? You don't have to answer that question. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled you to You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Son, we live in a world that has walls, and those walls have to be guarded by men with guns. Who's gonna do it? You? You, Lieutenant Weinberg? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Santiago, and you curse the Marines. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know, that Santiago's death, while tragic, probably saved lives, and my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves lives. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. We use words like honor, code, loyalty. We use these words as the backbone of a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. 
I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very freedom that I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I would rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a weapon and stand a post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Did you order the code red? I did the job. Did you order the code red? You're goddamn right I did! Please accord. I suggest the members be dismissed so that we can move to an immediate Article 39A session. The witness has rights. Captain Ross. Jack. The members of the court will retire to an anteroom until further instructed. All rise. What the hell is this? Colonel, what's going on? I did my job, I do it again. I'm gonna get on a plane and go on back to my base. You're not going anywhere, Colonel. MPs, guard the Colonel. Yes, sir. Captain Ross? What the hell is this? Colonel Jessup, you have the right to remain silent. Any statement I'm being charged with a crime. A trial by court is that what this is? Or administrative I'm being charged with a crime? Right to consult with a lawyer prior to any further this questioning. is funny. This lawyer may be a civilian That's what this is. By you at this your is... Expense, I'm gonna rip the lawyer. eyes out of your head and piss at your dead skull! You fucked with the wrong Marine! Colonel Jessup, you understand these rights as I've just read them to you. You fucking people. You have no idea how to defend a nation. All you did was weaken a country today, Kathy. That's all you did. You put people's lives in danger. Sweet dreams, son. Don't call me son. I'm a lawyer and an officer in the United States Navy. And you're under arrest, you son of a bitch. Yep, yeah, okay. So, uh... The witness is excused. Very interesting. Uh... Yes. That was nice. Okay. So, what are the emotions you think were on display here? <laughs> anger. Yes. So, who displayed anger? The colonel displayed anger. <laughs> So who displayed anger? Both displayed anger. Yeah. So what is the what is your overall understanding of this whole clip? What, what what is what is what did you gather? You can sure. Stop sharing. Hmm? Reaction to a trigger, very good. Okay. He admitted to very good. He admitted to his. What he did only because he was not thinking. And that's what happens actually when you display um, emotions and you're not really in control of your faculties. Yeah. So um, that's one danger of being in a highly emotional state. What else? What else was on display? It was a deliberate provocation. Yeah. So if the starting was a deliberate provocation to get, why do you think he displayed such anger? That's the interesting question. The question is, why do you think uh, Colonel Nathan Jessup displayed that kind of anger? Hmm? His perspective about following orders, what else? His ego was being challenged, right? And he's a senior military officer who was being <laughs> interrogated by a very junior uh, lieutenant, yeah? Not given that kind of importance, yes. What else? What else? What else happened there? So it was right, you're right. It was deliberate provocation. So many people will deliver, particularly if you get into union negotiations. So, um, um, madam, you have something to say. Yeah, you have something to say. Yeah. 
No, I find you giggling and laughing very frequently. If you have a joke, please share it with us. We uh, we might like to laugh with you. Wonderful. Right. So um, you so the, the point is that particularly in negotiations when you are dealing with say unions, and now you may not be very aware of trade unions and so on and so forth. They deliberately provoke you to get angry and why do they do that so that you will say things that you don't you don't want to or you might give concessions or you might lose focus so in any negotiation scenario you always need to be in control of your emotions because it's it's critical as to how you will make decisions and how you will react to the other party and it's a common ploy to get people angry because you lose control about what you are thinking or what you are saying. Yeah. Um, what else do you think? Um, any other emotion that was a display? There was an element of uh, disgust. So if you listen to the end carefully, he says, "Don't call me son. I'm an I'm an officer in the United States Navy. So sort of um, uh, refer to me." Uh, properly yeah so uh, he was also very upset that a senior officer is you know putting a blame on very junior people you see them sitting there you should go you should actually watch the movie because it is full of um concepts yeah so it's full of ob concepts so uh, the point I was trying to make is that highly emotionally distraught people make very, very poor decisions. And also as a ploy in emotional intelligence, you can actually be um, sort of provoked into getting into a state of mind. And, you know, for me, it was very close because my father was an HR director in a very large organization, which had a lot of workers. It had 50. So, so if you go back to the 1970s, where you had communist unions, and communist unions were very, very violent, and they would sort of uh, intimidate people. So he would, he had to negotiate several things, including salaries. And he would say that the greatest thing that uh, he learned was never to lose his temper, one, and never to speak stuff that was not required to be spoken. That is, it is better to keep silent rather than say things and get, admit something that you would regret later on. Yeah. So it's a very interesting. So we'll move on to attitudes. Um, the next, and we'll talk about attitude quickly. No, no, no the PPT. You can stop this. Piece. I also put up a couple of articles on the uh, LMS, which you can sort of. Uh, read. So I put up this quote from the Upanishad simply to tell you that attitude was something which was discovered, which was discussed from about 3000 years ago. Yeah, it's not new. It's not a new construct. People were concerned about uh, attitudes from many, many, many millennia. And why is that? Why do you think attitude is so important? Why do you think attitudes, uh, why do you think, when people say that, does he have a good attitude or a bad attitude? Why do you think attitude is important? Why is attitude discussed so much? It, not really. Not really. Attitude and personality are quite uh, distinct terms. Why is attitude so important? It, it influences work that you do, okay? It, it builds relationships. It builds relationships, not, yeah, maybe so, but what is the, what is the big construct of attitude? It represents you. It, what? Represents you. It represents you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Attitude will result in a behavior. Very good. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. So all behavior eventually stems from our, and that's why attitudes are so important because um, when people say that 
X or Y has got a bad attitude towards something, it really doesn't mean too much, except for the fact that you can expect poor behavior to follow somewhere along the line. And that is why attitude is discussed and a lot of organizations. So for example, somebody who really believed in attitude was a guy called Herb Keller. Herb Keller was a person who joined, who sort of created the first low cost airline in the history of civil aviation. And Southwest Airlines was a grand success. Herb Keller, he said that we hire for attitude and train for skill. So it is not the other way around. We don't hire for skills. We hire for attitude and train people for their, why? Because he believed he was in a customer service industry and how people interacted with customers was very, very critical. And you have another, we'll look at a, a video a little later. I will request uh, uh, Imtiaz to play it for us. It talks about the Taj hotels. And it's very interesting. I've also attached the article, which you can read at your leisure on the LMS, uh, which talks about, it's a, it's a Harvard Business School article, but the video is also very, very nice. So um, some of the things that we need to, you need to understand is, what are the three components of attitude? Summarize the relationship between attitude and behavior. Um, compare major job. So this is what you should be interested in. The major job attitude. What are some of the major job attitudes for example, job satisfaction is an attitude. Yeah? And um, there are some people who you may or may not agree, but there are some people who are never satisfied. They are disgruntled for life. You can do nothing that makes them happy. So how do you, how do you deal with such people when they apply for a job in your company? Keep them out. Because nothing that you can do actually makes them and they can be actually very destructive because they will spread negativism through the so they have they have issues with um uh, with themselves poor attitude and they bring it into the workspace and cause problems and what is the bigger problem i sometimes see this in actually the classes as well what is the bigger problem what is the bigger problem? Correct. What is the bigger problem? And we'll talk about it when we do groups and teams. Very interestingly that, you know, um, Maruti Suzuki in their Guru, uh, Gurugram plant about 10 years back, a set of about um, maybe about 30, 40 workers surrounded by another thousand people the HR, there was a wage negotiation going on and the HR staffer, middle level, he was going home. They caught hold of him, put him into a car, poured petrol and lit it on, set it on fire. Why do you think? Why do you think they did that? And then when the high court in Delhi sentenced each of them to 25 years in jail, plus several other hundred people got other varied punishments, they all cried. They all cried literally. These are not brave people. What do you think drove them to set a poor guy, put him in a car and set it on fire? What do you think happened here? Fair enough, but what else happened? A very interesting phenomenon here. And I would urge all of you to be a little careful. It, it, research has shown that when we get into a group, our confidence levels rise. Why? Because we think we are not accountable individually, but you are accountable. Like the Delhi High Court showed and put those 20 people for to 20 years in jail who are accountable. The fellows who were nearest the car and who put that guy into the car were sentenced to 20 years. Several other people got several other uh, varied punishments. So you can have people with poor attitudes. You can have them influence. And then if they get into a group or a mob, they can stir up emotions. And then because people believe that they are not accountable in a group, we're a group, so everybody can't be punished. It is farthest from the truth. And in any law binding system, those guys will be nailed and sorted out. Yeah? Um, 
so define job satisfaction summarize the main causes of job satisfaction why do, why are people satisfied or dissatisfied identify three outcomes of job satisfaction and we'll talk about some of these um in the time we have and um so just i will call you back all you please come here exactly at uh, 12 o'clock so uh southwest airlines chairman and founder herb keller says airplanes don't make any money when they are sitting on the is only mantra he spoke nothing what does this tell you what does this tell you airplanes don't make any money when they're sitting on the ground yeah but it also it also passes a message to his people that if we need to survive as an organization we need to have our airlines or aircraft flying and so you can't have them so turnaround times in southwest airlines are very 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 quick and the 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 times between an aircraft landing and taking off was very very small he actually revolutionized the civil aviation industry and um no no wonder so so it also goes to show that if you do some of the ordinary things well you can actually make a lot of progress and sometimes we mess up the very simple things in organizations actually causing bigger problems you don't have to be a rocket rocket scientist to do your job all you need to do is to set good habits and do the ordinary things very very meticulously and well and herb keller is a good example so attitudes are evaluative statements either favorable or unfavorable about objects people or so when you have an attitude it's always about an object it's about an event or it's about people so you can have an attitude i don't like the ipl could be a attitude i don't like a person of that religion is it attitude yeah i don't like that person because of so and so reason is again an attitude and the problem again i i would like to repeat is that it is problematic because this has an following cognitive output where you start thinking about something and then eventually it leads to a behavior so in the case of the ipl you might say i don't want to watch it i don't want to go there which is fine but when it comes to your workplace and there's a person involved it has a little bit of a problem because you might not like to include this person in your team you might like to exclude the person you might like to not share information you might like like not to work with the person and so on and so forth so attitudes are extremely important and you must somebody said personality you must understand the difference between attitude personality motivation and so on and so forth and be very clear about what each of them means so the uh, uh what is the abc model or the acb model uh, is the affective behavioral and cognitive part of a so for example for example the feeling part uh, is you were you were set up for promotion you were supposed to get your promotion in 15 days time on the appointed day it was you found that your best friend got promoted and you missed out on the or worse your worst enemy got promoted and you um didn't make the cut so what happens now what do you is there a feeling which happens yeah i mean the feeling generally is that my boss is i used to see this even the famous viva i was talking about when i made captain i used to see several people when you are waiting if they come out they are elated and what do they say i passed suppose they failed what would they say he failed me yeah so it's what is called as attribution all success is attributed to ourselves all failure is attributed to i am in this condition because my parents did not take care of my education properly or my parents did not leave me enough of money or my parents did not get me married to the right boy or slash girl so uh, human beings attribute because that is how they ma manage to maintain their sanity because if you go on blaming yourself for everything you might actually jump off the 10th floor yeah so um the affective the feeling part i dislike my 
supervisor because I think he or she is unfair and biased. So what happens now? Now there is a cognitive process. It sets for the thought process in the head and you have cognition. That is, my supervisor gave a promotion to a co-worker who deserved it less than I did. My supervisor is unfair. So the cognition kicks in and then eventually it leads to behavior. That is, I'm looking for other work. I've complained about my supervisor to anyone who would listen. So this is the chain of events that happen. What, what else? So this is a negative attitude towards your supervisor. Suppose you were in this situation, what would you do? Would you follow this trail similarly? Or would you do something else? What would you do? You would like to understand. So that's more positive. You can go and ask this person, why did I not get promoted? Or why do you like that person more than me? I keep on seeing on Facebook, there is some girl who keeps weeping that, you know, when I was on vacation, I got fired by Google. I mean, I, I, I understand. I mean, do, does Google pay you to be on vacation? Yeah. So um, those good old days are probably done with. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, how else would you approach this problem? One is you go and talk to the person who did not give you the promotion. What else? Understand if you have made a mistake and you would like to correct. So those are different kinds of approaches which you could have. All of them reflect your fundamental what? Attitude about your supervisor, about Suppose you like your supervisor and he didn't promote you, you can actually go and have a conversation or a discussion and so on and so forth. So good organizations try to promote such behaviors which shape attitude in a certain way. So we've talked about attitude shaping behavior. So there was a social scientist called Leon Festinger who said the diametrically opposite. He said that behavior can also shape and that was a you know much discussed event because they said that behaviors come from but how do you explain behavior shaping an attitude or changing an attitude can you think of an example well i drink some fresh water mm. we'll stay with humans okay dog or continue mm. That's okay. Shaping behavior. I'm talking about behavior shaping attitude. We are not sure dogs have attitude or at least it's not been measured yet. Okay. Fair enough. I, I'm talking about yourself. I'm to say, you, if you put yourself as the protagonist of this case, and definitely your attitude reflects in a behavior. I'm saying that you ha can you change that by behaving in a different way? So, for example, okay, let me sort of cut to the chase. And if nobody has any example to give. Yeah, no, that is that is fair. That's fair. You're being transparent and open. I'm talking. So, for example, um, let's take a hypothetical situation. You have grown up in a very closed, ultra conservative family, and you have been taught to hate people of another denomination or religion. Yeah, that is an attitude. 
So whenever you come across these people, you don't want to associate, you have negative feelings and so on, so forth. Can this, can something happen which changes that attitude? Then it there might be. I, I think more traumatic events, like say you're caught in a riot and you are helped by somebody of that religion, it can actually change the way you look at. I have seen this in, you know, especially when I was growing up. Um, for several people, America was a distant dream. And so they would say America, most of them because of jealousy and they couldn't go. They would say that, you know, it's a horrible country. Most of the people are divorced, they drink too much. Um, so many things. But then their children or somebody would go to America and then they would follow and then they would come back and say, what a great country. And, um, you know, uh, when will our country become like that country? There's a diameter. So their attitude towards the United States has changed. Why? Because behavior drove attitude. They, they left India, they went there, they had a look and now they have a different kind of... Uh, so Leon Festinger was actually right. And you can get behaviors to change, which is very important for managers, in fact. You can get behaviors to change attitudes in people. Yeah. So, uh, but attitude and behavior, the relationship can be very, very uh, interesting. And um, attitude predict, predicts behavior. Attitude, so some of the moderating, um, some of the moderating variables the attitude's importance corresponding to behavior, corresponds to behavior, accessibility, presence of social pressures, whether a person has direct experience with the attitude. So you have an attitude. How strong, what we're trying to discuss here is how strong is your corresponding behavior to that particular attitude? What do you guys think? What moderates? What are the moderating variables there? So, for example, all of us have attitudes about something. So, you you don't you dislike the IPL? Will you go and dig up the pitch in KSA? Can there be somebody who will go and dig up the pitch? There might be. You might have an attitude towards somebody of a different religion or a caste you mentioned, like you mentioned. Will you go and assault that person? There are people who would do that. So what is moderating that behavior? What do you think is more? One is, of course, education. I think education is a great uh, leveler. Yeah, It gets you to open your mind and be, keep your instincts a little bit under control. But otherwise, hmm? emotions, yes, okay. But what are those moderating variables? Why do some people react more violently to a situation than other people? What is what is going on? So those people won't have control uh, on their. Yeah, yeah. Why? I'm asking you why. That we know they don't have control. The question is why. We are, this this session is all about why. We're trying to get to the depth of it. From the childhood, okay, very good. They act with the feeling side. Peer pressure. Very good. They're grown up like that. Okay. Okay. They want to be heard or, 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 or they want to be the news kind of. Okay. So, you know, uh, several, I'll, I'll give you an example and I hope I can make it clearer. Immaturity. What's that? Immaturity. Yeah, absolutely. Immaturity. Immature people react more. Immature, uneducated people react more instinctively to several things and they don't think too much. Uh, and that's why I believe that, uh, I mean, I'm saying this tongue in cheek, I think uh, uh, Rahul Dravid was not a very great captain because he thought too much and he was too well educated. Yeah, sometimes you need to go by instinct. But anyway, you know, several years back um, um, when I was on leave, uh, my son one day told me that some older boys in the a school bus were sort of throwing his lunch box many, many years back and I'm not as I am now. 
and i'd come home from on leave so i was there for about 3 months 2 months and so i went to the bus i talked to his the driver first of all and said can you intervene and stop this so a couple of days later i again asked him he said no it continues then i went and spoke to his teacher who was also traveling in the bus so later two days i said uh, no it still continues so about the end of the week um and uh, generally when i go on my morning walk i have a nice bit on which these army guys use it's a short thick stick which can actually make people feel pain so i got into the bus identified those three fellows and told them that next time i hear once more my son talking about you you are going to get the short end of this stick i got down walked off so i asked him next day did this happen he said no it stopped that's not the point the point is why did i do this correct what else let's look at the big picture why do you think i reacted so do i have an attitude here definitely did a behavior follow an attitude what was the attitude at display here i don't know all, all those are mechanic interventions what is the big attitude you are seeing here hmm? so the so i have a pathological hatred towards bullies i dislike bullies wherever i find them i i go after them why what why absolutely absolutely so when i was in school i remember very clearly that older boys would bully you and you did not have defense mechanisms so my attitude towards bullies is not only very strong now that i am older and stronger i feel i should do something about it i also recollect those memories very clearly so you can see that so those are the moderating variables and also why didn't i really hammer them because social pressure you know i i i tempered my behavior because i was a little cautious as to what would be the the social outcome of my but had this gone a little bit more maybe it would have come to come to that yeah so attitudes importance which is very important correspondence to behavior accessibility it's on top of my mind presence of social social pressures it was there whether a person has direct experience with attitude yes so if if you tick all these boxes the behavioral outcome of an attitude is very strong and that is why you need to be a little careful because you do not know what people have gone through in their childhood and younger days and it might actually emerge as as yeah and it erupt at the wrong time so um uh, uh, the idea is to be a little bit neutral when you meet new people and try to assess them and size them up before you make assumptions play jokes pranks and so on and so forth which can go out of control so attitude is very critical for all of you as managers some of the major job attitudes are job satisfaction yeah which we talked about job involvement that is are you involved with your how many people do you think are involved with their job i am very involved with my job i love my job and so i turn up on a saturday to teach i could have professor vinay teaching me yeah some people are involved with their jobs and others are not and um it's very difficult to make out at interviews i don't know how many of you are involved with your jobs but if you are not involved with your job then it is seen as a negative attitude because it gives rise to say lack of productivity lack of interest and so on and so forth psychological empowerment is belief in the degree of influence over one's jobs i was telling you about what is psychological empowerment do you feel you've got control over your job yeah do you all have control over your job absolutely sure you can do it well so tomorrow a problem arises can you manage it if you can't it causes it starts showing in your behavior like burnout stress and so on and so forth so psychological empowerment is very important belief in the degree of influence over one's job competence job meaningfulness and autonomy so how do you build empowerment how do you get empowerment over your job
with experience what else what is empowerment anyway? no what is empowerment so there was this there was this very interesting experiment conducted in the us in the 1940s yeah they were very interesting fellows the americans so this was uh, again done by a social scientist and uh, the experiment was as follows it took two rooms like this room 1 it had a metal floor he filled it with about 50 dogs or say 25 dogs all nice dogs they were all fairly friendly he would sort of and it it had a wall he would pass an electric current through the a mild current through the floor and the dog would feel pain it would jump in the air and then settle this went on for 3 months he kept doing this the dog would jump sit it would yelp a little bit bark this went on he then broke the wall yeah and made a one foot wall which was which could be easily crossed by the dog he introduced 25 more dogs yeah and he did the same experiment what do you think happened now so the 25 new dogs jumped once and then they saw that they could cross to the other side and they just jumped over that short wall and they went to the other side what do you think happened to the 25 original dogs they didn't go they stayed there and continued to get shocked they could have very easily followed the other dogs they could have jumped that small wall but this is what is called as learned helplessness and these are classic cases that's why you have say a lot of women who are in abusive marriages they refuse to leave yeah or you have a bad boss but you continue to hang on over there you refuse to get empowered or you refuse to take matters into your own hands and then chart a course for your this is a classic experiment learned helplessness yeah go and read about it and about the dogs it tells you a lot about human behavior and many humans actually enjoy abuse i think yeah they refuse to go and take the easiest path out that is a path of dignity and to empower them. how but the question is how do you empower yourself how do you empower yourself hmm? what take lead how do you empower yourself by choosing the right path chief you are making these motherhood statements like the buddha no but i am asking you how tell me how get, let us get to the ground level very basic taking the right path yes that's what the great buddha said in 500 bc take the right path influence by working damn hard at what you do that is how you empower yourself there is no shortcut that's why your parents might have told you work hard yeah so empower empowerment comes when you have control over what you are doing and you feel safe and you feel you have alternative so all of you are you empowered people what do you think i think you are because you made this wonderful decision to come and join this program and sit here on a saturday morning and listen to me so you are trying to improve your selves you are trying to get better you are trying to empower this is not a motivational talk eh? you are already admitted so um i i i'm just trying to tell you that that you need to sort of work harder at whatever you do so that you are empowered so that you have choices otherwise you will be like that dog who keeps on getting shocked and in a state of helplessness yeah so psychological empowerment is very important organizational commitment so there is something called as organizational commitment behavior what is that so for example there is a famous story about 
this guy from dhl you know dhl courier yeah so this man had to deliver a football to a old lady who lived in the midwest or somewhere in the us and um, he was driving when he suddenly found that there was a faulty fuel gauge and he had actually no fuel worse he goes to the petrol bank and then now he finds he has left his wallet at home so the so the bank guy is refusing to give him gas so now he is wondering what to do but he has an expensive watch given to him by his girlfriend which he sort of gives to the and says keep this i'll come back with the money he goes and delivers the ball and then he's got his job done do you think this is unusual behavior it is it is how many of you really how many of you will actually give your watch given you to you by your girlfriend to the petrol bank owner yeah this is what is called as organization commitment behavior where people go you know be much beyond their normal jobs to sort of so this is a this is yeah this is the kind of people that organization want this is the attitude they want to see in in you because if they have these kind of attitudes then just take, take the case of marriott marriott tells this the story of a young lady who was positioned in the reception area not a regular job but she was sitting there when she got a call when she got a call from somebody who said i want to order dinner so she said madam this is not the room service or kitchen but anyway i'll get you your order what would you like to order and uh, 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 this older person said that i would like to order whatever she like to order she ordered what happens after that that's it it's the end right but no this young girl calls her back after half an hour and says did you enjoy the meal not her job so the old lady says no i did not enjoy the meal i did not eat anything so she says why she says i got news that my husband is in his last stages in new york and they are in chicago and worse the final flight is leaving in about half an hour and i am not going to make it that's the end again but no so this girl tells her you pack your bags immediately i will see what i can do and she calls the airport gets this flight to be delayed and the the she says i'm calling from the marriott hotels and they say that this is going to cost marriott hotels a lot of money if you're going to delay the flight she says no problem marriott will pay and this is a fresher young girl and um, the lady gets to the airport goes to new york meets her husband who dies that night but she is very grateful marriott not only paid that money they rewarded this girl for what is called as organization commitment because for marriott the customer is is king and it reflects behavior that the organization wants to but just look at this young girl how do you build organization commitment behavior in people is very very important and there are several stories that you can talk about but it's important um because if people are not committed to organize you, you the organizations don't want you to be committed to yourself they want you to be committed to yeah and that is why the armed forces carry carry out such go to such length in assessing people's commitment levels their personality because they want them to be committed to a something bigger than themselves yeah good so also uh, uh, an attitude that you might have is what is called as perceived organizational support that is what kind of support you expect so say for example during covid time how many of you were fired so one or two so what do you think about your organization good feelings bad feelings business yeah so but generally so generally if you believe that your organization is supporting you in difficult times yeah um, i remember instance when i had sort of uh, many years back um, uh, for the first time gone to this place called dubai again for a strangely for a um, ship repair op operation and as you know dubai can be very hot yeah and i did not really really factor in the kind of heat that we would and this was a dry dock that is 
land is excavated you put your ship into the middle of it there is no water and then they repair everything and then put you back into the water anyway it's a technical operation which i won't go into but the first day we worked we worked from say 7 o'clock in the morning till 6:30 in the evening and then next day morning when the alarm went off i could hear the alarm but i couldn't raise my arm and i found that i was i couldn't move my brain was functioning but i couldn't move at severe dehydration somehow i rolled off the bed got up and i could see people lying all over the place and um, most of us most of the people on board were severely dehydrated because of the heat and then sort of i made a few calls and actually we had doctors positioned on board continuously and we were told to cut down our working hours from 12 hours a day to about 7 8 hours and so we would work in the cooler hours then we would take a break till between 8 in the morning to about 2 in the afternoon then again we would turn up and do something so the length of the repair got stretched at massive cost but we all felt happy that we were well taken care of and it built a lot of gratitude towards our so the, so so the commitment levels also come from how organizations treat you during difficult times and um, two good examples are say um, this is a, there's a company called caterpillar um, which is head office is in bengaluru but they got their manufacturing plant in hosur and a few years back they were going through very difficult times where the requirement for their earth moving machinery had dropped so um so they could have laid off people american company eh? but what they did was they told their employees that don't come to work every day come only for three days the other two days we will put you through training programs so they fired nobody everybody's salary dropped to an extent but nobody was fired and then when they came back to normal they sort of just continued on their normal operation so perceived organizational support is very very important where how employees perceive you as a organization yeah and things like employee engagement um again the individuals involvement with satisfaction with an enthusiasm for the work engaged employees are passionate about their work and company please understand what some of these are intrinsic personality traits there are i like i said there are many people who are you can do nothing to make them they just they just dispassionate yeah so um i'm getting paid only this much why should i do so much is a have you heard of that pretty common yeah you will have um you will have you'll have uh, sort of many um, folks saying that but then that's a very sad attitude to carry because it allows you not to be involved with your organization or be passionate about why is passionate improve important i'd like to show you one uh, uh clip actually i don't know but 2010 about this guy captain sully sullenberger maybe i'll show you sometime he landed his plane on the hudson in the hudson is a river yeah a uh, very interesting move because um this was a commercial airline it had several hundred passengers on board both the engines conked off in mid air over new york he turned around and landed his plane on the so i was asking my air force friends that what do you think they said this guy must be brilliant this guy is not an ordinary pilot to even attempt something like but the fact of the matter is that he saved all his all his crew passengers and the aircraft yeah they had an enquiry and they tried to check whether he was mad or something later but but he was a great pilot so that's not the story the important story is when sullenberger was interviewed later he said that he thought about nothing but flying from the age of 5 yeah he knew everything about flying that there was that is passion when you have untrammeled devotion to a particular event or job that is passion not once in a week i feel passionate about doing something you know other times i'm just lazing around um so um you have these young kids who say i'm very passionate about playing cricket for india but what are you doing about it i'm watching tv 
I am watching. Is that, is that how you going to get sort of uh, uh, get to play for India? You're not going to get to play. Or or um, um, so these are these are very interesting things. The, the passion should be followed by action and ability to work hard on whatever you like to. So some people, some of my students put. I don't know whether you are also putting. Uh, what do you? What is your hobby? Listening to old Lata Mangeshkar songs. So unless you get into the song industry, I don't see how that is going to help you. Organizations want to see what you have. Have you done a certification in Python? Have you done a certification in HR analytics? Because they can see that you built a track record over. Correct, correct, correct. Come on, uh, can I just call you back, please? Yeah. So, um, yeah, are passionate about their work and company. So, obviously, job attitudes overlap each other and they impinge upon each other. It's also, you know, what two months? It's also about several things um, coming together in terms of. Um, so, for example, you might feel you might feel dispassionate about a certain job, and then you change companies and go something, do and do something else. You might now feel very passionate about what you are. Why does that happen? Because this, the ground realities might have changed, the situation might have changed, the context might have changed, and so on and. So far, yeah. What drives passion? Passion actually. Interest, yes. Inspiration, okay. Willingness. Yeah. So there can be several things that drive your passion. So, for example, uh, you know, um, people who were rescued from Auschwitz. Auschwitz was this uh, uh, Jew uh, camp, which is in uh, Poland. Poland, yeah. So people were interviewed as to how did you survive? And they said that our parents told us do anything that is required to stay alive. They said, do whatever is required, but don't die. Don't give up. That was their passion. So passion can come from several reasons, several requirements. You're not able to figure out why some people are passionate, other people are not, whether it has got something to do with their childhood whether it has got something to do with um, you know, the way they are brought up or their cognitive skills or whatever it might be. But obviously, you need passionate people in your organizations. Yeah? So what is job satisfaction? A positive feeling about a job resulting from an evaluation of its... What are, what are, what are these characteristics? What are some characteristics of a job? So for example, so for example, um, is it better in a, in a university system, is it better to be a professor or to be a data entry clerk? Why? Value, one, yes. Impactful, yes. What else? Leave the salary part of it. High, I won't say high salary, higher salary. So, huh? okay, dignity, what else? You're getting to learn, okay. You're making, absolutely. So it's very impactful. And you have autonomy. Yeah, I, have... I don't think any job has more freedom than a teacher's job. I can actually shape this class any which way I want. Yeah, that is a great empowering uh, feeling which professors have. So that is why teaching is such an exciting job because, and I can see, I can, I get instant feedback whether you guys like my class. Or not. Yeah, which is again, very important. Which is very important because I need to know, feed, people thrive on feedback, especially high achievers. If you don't give high achievers feedback, they will run away. Yeah, so these are job characteristics and jobs that don't, taking people for a, thank God it's Friday party is of no use. If the job is boring, you need to make the job interesting. Then people will stay and work at jobs, not because you take them for random parties 
um, some cricket match on one Saturday in the afternoon somewhere, and so on and so forth. But invariably, you will have HRs who will do this kind of have some secret Santa during uh, during uh, Christmas time where everybody exchanges some gift, this, that, and that, right? Yeah. So the fact of the matter is they should be looking at the job characteristics to determine whether you're empowered, whether there's auton autonomy is freedom to shape the job, whether it's impactful, whether you feel, that's why you have people, I can tell you, a young second lieutenant in the, in the Indian army earns less than a call center employee maybe. Why do they do it with so much of passion and pride? Because the job, can, first of all, they represent India. Two is they feel that they are doing something very constructive or important. Yeah. Thirdly, they pretty much have got a lot of freedom in their own little sphere. Four is it all this coming together makes them feel very, very wanted and important. And the ecosystem in the armed forces is very, very good. Yeah. So what causes job? So all these uh, things you can please read yeah, for yourself. Yeah. Okay, now I will request my friend. Uh, um, so what are some res responses to job dissatisfaction? What are some responses to job dissatisfaction? Attrition, what else? So the lowest form of dissatisfaction is gossip. You don't like the boss. Okay, I saw him in that uh, Mantri mall with uh, the secretary. So is, is, is the most fundamental form of gossip. Spreading gossip about. And the, and, and the worst form is you pull out a gun and shoot a couple of. So there is a full continuum of what. Or you can actually uh, sabotage. You can break something. You can you can leak a source code, of or if you're working in a software development company, whatever it is, or or you can leak internal information, and so on and so forth. So these are all manifest. Or or you can uh, come late to office every day. First signs that you are dissatisfied with your job or dissatisfied with what is going. Coming late or what is called as tardiness, tardy behavior is the first signs of dissatisfaction with because you want to avoid it. Yeah. So good. I'll stop there. I'll request uh, Sri Imtiaz to play a nice video. This is a very interesting video. You should watch it. There's an associated article which has been attached to the LMS. I will publish it now. And please read that article. And this will take about 10, 12 minutes. So guys online, we're going into a video. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just raise the volume a little bit. Um, on the 26th of uh, November 2008, as you just heard, uh, a group of 10 terrorists attacked the city of Mumbai, what used to be called Bombay in India. Uh, they broke up into teams to attack about a dozen different locations. One of those locations was the iconic, beautiful, 103-year-old Taj Mahal Palace Hotel in South Bombay. For three nights, two days, there was absolute havoc in that hotel. Guests were terrorized, people wounded, shot, killed. Um, this group of uh, terrorists with automatic weapons, um, plastic explosives and grenades and backpacks roamed freely through this old hotel. Many of us, uh, many of you, witnessed or saw some of that coverage 
on television at, at, at home. Uh, let's take a closer look. The evening of November 26, 2008, was a typical busy Wednesday for the Taj. More than 500 guests were registered at the hotel. Another five to 600 were attending functions in banquet halls or sitting down to dinner in the hotel's 10 restaurants. Shortly after 9 p.m., an explosion rocked the Leopold Cafe just around the corner, less than 200 meters from the Taj. Two young men pulled out automatic weapons and began firing. Crowds at the Gateway of India and along the street in front of the Taj panicked, many rushing the doors of the hotel. In the ensuing chaos, two heavily armed terrorists circumvented the metal detectors and entered the lobby. They were soon joined by the two attackers from the Leopold, who broke through a back door. 9.35 or 9.40 was the first call I got from one of my chefs. And he think some shooting is taking place. A person has been shot dead outside my restaurant. Then we heard another gunshot, and I, said, I told him on the phone only, I said, just close all the kitchens, all the restaurant doors. They were banging the doors. They were alerting everyone, come out, otherwise they'll shoot you. There were a few guests that were, who, you know, they were scared and they came out by putting their hands up, like, and they started hitting them, they started harassing them. It was horrible. The situation, the entire scenario was very scary. We couldn't uh, judge at that time ki what is exactly happening in the hotel. It was a literally boss situation. You can hear grenade lobbying around. You can hear the gunshot also. We did not know the scale of the attack. We did not know uh, what exactly was going on, where they were uh, at that moment. And there was total chaos. The colleagues were trapped with guests in various places, asking me what, we, what should we do next. So picture what's happening um, inside that hotel. There are uh, 500 guests who are registered at that hotel this night of uh, 26th November. There are a, an addi additional 600 or so guests who are in various restaurants attending various banquets and functions. Uh, there are about 600 or so staff members on duty that night. Young people, many of them very young, 20, 30 year old, some of them had the staff members had only been working for a few years at this hotel. Um, many of them um, fathers and mothers, uh, the sole breadwinners in their families with, with children at home waiting for them. One of the things, we don't know a lot about the detail uh, about what happened there, but one of the things we do know is that all 600 of these employees knew all the back routes. They, they knew the exits, they knew the entrances, they knew the hallways, the kitchen galleys. In other words, they knew how to get out and how to get out fast. All the research we have in psychology would tell us that the natural human instinct at a time of terror like this is to flee. So think about it, what, what you would do. So when I teach this case study at Harvard, I ask my students, I say, how many of these employees do you think fled and how many of them do you think stayed? And they'll hazard guesses and, and the maximum they say that would stay would be maybe, maybe a quarter, 150 or so, you know, but that's, that's the maximum. Everybody who can run away will run away. Well, the truth of the matter is that nobody ran away. They all stayed. In fact, some of them not only stayed, they helped guests out and came back in to help more guests. It's an amazing story. These are some of their stories. The staff of the Taj stayed on duty throughout the siege, calming frightened guests and assisting in their rescue. Many even came back inside after leading guests out of the building. 
members of the hotel's team of telephone operators, originally evacuated, voluntarily returned to their stations and stayed on all night. They became the hub of communication uh, at that point. They were the ones calling every single guest room, talking to the guests and telling them to stay in, don't step out, lock your door. As the terrorists roamed the halls, telephone operators instructed trapped guests to pull their key cards to turn off the illuminated occupied button in the hallway outside their doors. The attack started at 9.30 in the evening. Till 4 o'clock they were answering guest calls. I think that speaks a lot for a hotel under attack. Among the guests at the Taj that night were members of the global board of directors and senior management team of Unilever, who had gathered along with their spouses to honor incoming and outgoing CEOs. So we had this really elaborate seven-course meal, and that was sort of the setting, the mood, there was warmth, there was laughter, there was a perfect setting for, for a nostalgic farewell and a perfect setting for a nice welcome. And I heard what seemed to me, which is an untrained ear, like firecrackers in the hotel. We started getting these text messages and phone calls. Uh, there were some gunmen on the loose. The only logical thing to do was to close the doors and um, just stay put. Malika came to us and said, we think there's a problem. We're not sure what exactly it is, but I request all of you to be on the ground right now. The, the level of calm and composure that the staff displayed was amazing, it was absolutely amazing because they had the presence of mind to even advise us saying, couples, please separate, don't stay at the same place, just be in different corners of the room. 65 lives at stake, so can't take a chance. So obviously we were in touch with security all the time and uh, had a lot of alcohol in the room. So that helped a little. This went on the whole night. We were on the floor with our hearts in our mouth, with debris falling all around us, the noises of you know firecrackers all around. And all through, the staff kept their composure, kept coming to us, saying, do you want some water, do you want something? Well, I was scared, but uh, there was something more important to be done. And this went on till 4 or 5 in the morning when the room filled with smoke. So we had no choice but to find a way to escape. The entire corridor outside the hall was on fire. So there was no way we could get out. The fire guys were outside and they were dousing the fire on the sixth floor. And we happened to see Mr. Kang downstairs as well. So he sort of ushered the fire guys to us. Uh, we sort of climbed onto the ledge and did some stuff which in today's normal day I wouldn't be able to do. But we sort of came onto the ledge, climbed down to the ladders which by then the fire brigade people had come. The staff insisted that we would go first, guests would go first. And they kept like that till all of us had come down and then they all came down. Well, in a way, because I was there, I was looking after the function, I was, in, I was responsible. I could have been the youngest in the room and I know at one point of time I was the youngest in the room, but uh, I was still doing my job. The easiest thing for our staff to do at that point in time was to drop whatever they were doing and run out of the hotel. Not one did that. Not one. I come from an army background. Not myself, but my father, who was a, he retired as a general in the army. And he used, often used to say, when I was even appointed here as the general manager, he used to often tell me that you are now like the captain of, captain of the ship. And I think that's the way you think, that, that you, are the, you are the captain of the ship, and uh, if the, you have to be the last one to leave. And if it sinks, you sink with it. At some point, our kitchen brigade uh, decided that it looked like a lull in the thing and they could be taken out from the back of the kitchen through the fire exit to the back road. And our chefs had formed a human chain to escort people in the darkness down those stairs. And as hundreds of them were being evacuated, somehow two of those terrorists got to know that this was happening. And the terrorists arrived there and saw these uh, chefs lined up herding people away, and there was mayhem. They cut loose, and that's where we lost uh, 
we lost our biggest numbers there. Uh, we had five or six of our chefs gunned down, but they took the bullets. So that they risked their lives in just making sure that the guests were safe. I don't think we would have made it out of the hotel without the, the support, the assurance, the constant, uh, you know, service orientation that the staff provided, without doubt, which is why we will continue to be so grateful to them. I can't explain it. There were no manuals, there were no uh, instructions for what should be done under the circumstances. And so what seems to have happened is individuals, from the waiters to the managers of the restaurants, all had this uh, goal of uh, let's get the guests to safety. To reiterate, 500 registered guests, 600 guests in restaurants and banquets, like that Unilever Boer event that you just heard about. 600 employees. It's about 1,700 people that night. Of those 1,700, over 1,600 escaped safely. Only 34 people died. Of those 34, fully half were staff members at the hotel. So when we were working on this case study, I asked senior management how this happened, why this happened, what explains the behavior of their staff. And these are young people. Malika Jagat, the banquet manager for the Unilever event whom you saw speaking, 24 years old. What explains it? And you heard, they can't explain it. Senior management, Mr. Ratan Tata, head of the Tata group of companies, they own the Taj Hotels, he couldn't explain it. So I teach this at Harvard. I, come, I bring this case study back and I teach this at the Harvard Business School as a case study of leadership from below. You know, we teach usually about leadership as being something from the top that filters down. This is, this is leadership from below, it's just amazing. And I ask my students, how do you explain it? And they have plausible explanations for the behavior of the employees. Some of them say, well, it must be the culture, the national culture of India. You know, there must be something in the value system there that explains it. And in fact, there is. It turns out that there is a, a, a value or a belief that says a guest is to be treated like God. When a guest enters your home, treat her or him like God. Atiti Devo Bhava in Sanskrit. Other students say, no, 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 it's not national culture, it's corporate culture. If the Taj Hotels is owned by this family, the Tata Group, they have a long history in India of very benevolent human resource policies, uh, a, a family of, um, of integrity uh, in, in their business dealings. It's the, national, it's the uh, corporate culture. And others say, no, it's not that. This happened at a hotel. It's the industry culture. It's hospitality. Employees are trained to serve customers. So that's what's going on. All of these are very plausible. So along with another colleague, I decided to go back into the Taj Hotel company records to try to understand their human resource policy. Who were these people? Who, who were these staff? Where did they find them? How did they recruit them? How did they motivate them? How did they train them? And I learned lots of really, really intriguing things. Let me share in the interest of time, just three of them with you. First of all, you know, they recruit their first line, their front line employees from high schools, not from the major cities, not from Bombay or Delhi, Alcada or Madras. They recruit them from small towns, Haldia, Chandigarh, Nashik, Tiruchirapalli, small towns. And they recruit students, graduating students, for attitude, not grades. They ask their headmasters or their teachers, who are the students that you teach who have the most respect for older people, for their parents, for the teachers? They're not looking for the people, the students who do the best in grades, but rather for attitude. Then training. This is fascinating. You know, you've heard of brand ambassadors. Lots of companies, many organizations perhaps uh, you, that you represent, 
train their frontline staff to be ambassadors for the brand, for the company. You know what they do at the Taj Hotels? They train their frontline employees to be ambassadors for the customer, for the guest. It's very different, it's counterintuitive. They call them guest ambassadors. They believe frontline employees should be the voice of the client, of the customer, of the guest to the company. And third, and perhaps most importantly, their motivation system, their reward system, incentives, is not just monetary. They, they pay about average, little above average in that hotel sector in, in India. But they reward people with recognition, personal recognition. So when an employee does something that delights customers and the guest writes a note, within 48 hours that employee is recognized. 48 hours. They don't have to wait for a Diwali or a Christmas bonus. It happens within 48 hours. Amazing. In fact, they won the International Hermes Award for an innovation in human resource management for, for this STARS program. So let me, let me close by asking you to, to think a little bit about the lessons that you take away from this, from this company far away on the other side of the world, the things that we can learn here in America, that we can bring home, that we can scale to American businesses, American organizations. Things like the way customers are treated, building a customer-centric, guest-centric corporate culture, organizational culture, Rethinking the relationship, the contract between employer and employee. And finally, let me close by saying this is an amazing inspirational story that something that was supposed to be a symbol of terrorism is today a beacon of hope. Thank you. So you can actually... Uh... Thanks, Cynthia. So you can actually read the, uh, the article. I put it up on your LMS. You can download it and have a look. Watch the video again. Uh, it's very interesting as to why attitude is so important and um, not necessarily, just eight minutes. Why attitude is uh, so important and um, sometimes why it takes place. So I also want to make it very clear that <clears throat> while attitude is important, everything cannot be sorted out by attitude. You also need intelligent people. You need people with great cognitive skills and other skills and so on and so forth. But in many industries today, attitude is critical to hiring people and retaining them and so on and so forth. Okay, folk, with that, I shall stop. And thank you very much. Thank you. Sir. Guys online, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.